Now that Joseph has his own family back with him, does he continue to serve the household of Pharaoh with justice, or do his policies reduce the Egyptian people into slavery? Joseph has welcomed his family into Egypt, but that's not the end of our story. First, we'll see what kind of relationship they have with Pharaoh and the locals. Also, we're only a couple of years into the famine, and Joseph is still in charge and has some difficult decisions to make. And so, before we jump into the scriptures, let us take a moment to pray for the Lord's blessing as we read the sacred word. Joseph then said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go and inform Pharaoh, telling him, My brothers and my father's household, whose home is in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds, having long been keepers of livestock, and they have brought with them their flocks and herds, as well as everything else they own. So when Pharaoh summons you and asks what your occupation is, you must answer, We, your servants, like our ancestors, have been keepers of livestock from the beginning until now, in order that you may stay in the region of Goshen, since all shepherds are abhorrent to the Egyptians. As one who has not only lived in Egypt all of his life, but also was Pharaoh's right-hand man, Joseph takes this opportunity to coach his family on how to talk to the king. And he probably tells them more than just what to say, but also about the etiquette and the customs that they are to follow. And while it seems that his brothers followed his advice, his father, not so much, but more on that later. These verses also include a curious conversation about their occupation. And this again shows the shrewdness of Joseph and how he continues to protect his family and their descendants. There are a few reasons as to why Joseph makes sure to relay to Pharaoh and his officials the livelihood of his family. And the first has to do with the area that they will settle in. So let's talk a little bit about Goshen, which is not named in Egyptian sources. So where was it and what was its significance? The area is thought to be the Eastern Nile Delta, often called the Wadi Tumlat. This would later be the site of the city of Ramesses, which is referred to in the movie Prince of Egypt as the up and coming Pharaoh would be in charge of its construction. A gateway will open to the entire new city of white limestone, However, in the time of Joseph, it seems to have been an undeveloped property that was fertile enough to raise and pasture livestock. It was also far enough away from the cultural center of Egypt, which would be just as important for the Israelites. This is where Joseph initially had told his brothers that they would be living. Pharaoh, however, did not mention this land by name, but Joseph has a plan to make sure they will occupy it. And that's where the line about shepherds comes in. Joseph has two reasons for wanting his family to live in Goshen. One, it's a big, fertile piece of land. Two, it's far enough away from Egyptian influence. Now, Joseph is popular in Egypt, especially among the leaders, so they probably want his family to be near as well. They would want them to become Egyptians, just like the people of Shechem wanted to assimilate with them. But Joseph knows better. He knows of their gods, customs, and their pagan rituals. He wants to shield his family, particularly his impressionable brothers, from that influence. So he uses the best plan he has, using his awareness of Egyptian sensibilities. The plan is brilliant, yet simple. Tell the truth, that's all, just tell the truth. Exactly, Egyptian life was based on a caste system and shepherds were pretty low on that hierarchy. As we are told, they were abhorrent to the Egyptians. Now, tending sheep and cattle was a necessity, but it was not a clean job and the Egyptians did not want to do that and they were not high on the social structure. And so the Egyptians would keep their distance from them, but also they were guaranteed to have this great, nice plot of land. And so let's hear how Joseph's plan worked. As always, he uses both wit and wisdom. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers have come from the land of Canaan with their flocks and herds and everything else they own. And they are now in the region of Goshen. He then presented to Pharaoh five of his brothers whom he had selected from their full number. When Pharaoh asked them what their occupation was, they answered, we, your servants, like our ancestors, are shepherds. We have come, they continued, in order to stay in this country, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks in the land of Canaan. So severe has the famine been there. Please, therefore, let your servants settle in the region of Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, They may settle in the region of Goshen, and if you know any of them to be qualified, you may put them in charge of my own livestock. Thus, when Jacob and his sons came to Joseph in Egypt, and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, heard about it, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Now that your father and brothers have come to you, the land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and brothers in the pick of the land. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. After Jacob had paid his respects to Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How many years have you lived? Jacob replied, The years I have lived as a wayfarer amount to a hundred and thirty. 
Few and hard have been these years of my life, and they do not compare with the years that my ancestors lived as wayfarers. Then Jacob bade Pharaoh farewell and withdrew from his presence. As Pharaoh had ordered, Joseph settled his father and brothers and gave them holdings in Egypt on the pick of the land, in the region of Ramesses. And Joseph sustained his father and brothers and his father's whole household down to the youngest with food. This meeting seems to go much better than planned. First, Joseph picks five of his brothers, probably the most eloquent, and they do impress. Not only does Pharaoh give them the pick of the land, but also puts them in charge of his own livestock. And then after this, knowing that his family will be well taken care of, he presents him Jacob, his father. And Pharaoh is impressed with Jacob as well. In fact, he asks him how old he is because he's impressed with his age. Ancient Egyptian writing tells us that 110 was considered to be a very blessed and full life. So Jacob living 130 is quite impressive indeed. But not only this, in most translations it says that when Jacob met and also when he left Pharaoh, he not only greets him, but he blesses him. And this is more than just a standard greeting. May the force be with you. Exactly. It had more significance than just a formal greeting. And the fact that it is mentioned twice shows that it is something that is important, even that it came from God. Just as Pharaoh having two dreams showed that that too came from God and was something worth listening to. Pharaoh, of course, is considered a god to the Egyptians, yet Jacob is the one who gives the blessing. But the king does not take this as an insult. Instead, he seems to enjoy this conversation that he is having with the father of the man who saved Egypt. Pharaoh has already acknowledged how blessed his family must be, and his belief system allows for the existence of many deities. He may wonder about their ancestral god and how powerful he might be. The blessing is also an important moment in Jacob's own development, and in some ways acts as the beginning of his homecoming portion of the hero's journey. He is reclaiming his place in the story, after he had despaired when he believed that Joseph was dead. He now knows that Pharaoh has promoted his son to his position, and Jacob shows his gratitude with a blessing, which is ultimately from God himself, as we have seen. This Pharaoh has been instrumental in the life of the Israelites, and has been rewarded with blessings from the Lord. But Joseph's work is not done yet, for the famine continues. And so let's see what he plans on doing about it. Since there was no food in any country because of the extreme severity of the famine, and the lands of Egypt and Canaan were languishing from hunger, Joseph gathered in, as payment for the rations that were being dispensed, all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan, and he put it in Pharaoh's palace. When all the money in Egypt and Canaan was spent, all the Egyptians came to Joseph, pleading, Give us food, or we shall perish under your eyes, for our money is gone. Since your money is gone, replied Joseph, give me your livestock, and I will sell you bread in return for your livestock. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he sold them food in return for their horses, their flocks of sheep, and herds of cattle, and their donkeys. Thus he got them through that year with bread in exchange for all their livestock. When that year ended, they came to him in the following one and said, We cannot hide from my Lord that with our money spent and our livestock made over to my Lord, there is nothing left to put at my Lord's disposal except our bodies and our farmland. Why should we and our land perish before your very eyes? Take us and our land in exchange for food, and we will become Pharaoh's slaves and our land his property. Only give us seed that we may survive and not perish, and that our land may not turn into a waste. Thus Joseph acquired all the farmland of Egypt for Pharaoh, since with the famine too much for them to bear, every Egyptian sold his field, so the land passed over to Pharaoh, and the people were reduced to slavery from one end of Egypt's territory to the other. Only the priest's land Joseph did not take over, since the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived off the allowance Pharaoh had granted them. They did not have to sell their land. Joseph told the people, Now that I have acquired you and your land for Pharaoh, here is your seed for sowing the land. But when the harvest is in, you must give a fifth of it to Pharaoh, while you keep four-fifths as seed for your fields, and as food for yourselves and your families, and as food for your children. You have saved our lives, they answered. We are grateful to my Lord that we can be Pharaoh's slaves. Thus Joseph made it a law for the land in Egypt, which is still in force, that a fifth of its produce should go to Pharaoh. Only the land of the priests did not pass over to Pharaoh. The section is interesting on a number of levels, but let's look at the history first, because that seems to be one of the reasons that the biblical author recounted these events. In fact, the famous Greek historian Herodotus has confirmed a number of the details in this narrative in portions of his historical documents that were written in the 400s BC. What we see is basically the shift of power of Pharaoh, how he comes to be considered the owner of the land, and the centralization of government. 
And this account in Genesis shows that all of this was based on Joseph's land policy. Now, Joseph was not acting for his own benefit, but rather for the people of Egypt. And while it might not look so at first glance, this actually was benefiting the people. The entire countryside is affected by the famine, and people both in and out of Egypt have been purchasing grain from the stores that Joseph had saved. But the famine rages on. The economy has collapsed, and everyone is broke, except the royal house. It's good to be the king. Right. So Joseph's first plan is to trade bread for livestock, and this helped in a couple of ways. First, livestock took a lot of land and resources to care for, and the people were more concerned about feeding their families and their children. And so by taking the livestock, that is one less mouth that they have to feed. And Joseph and his family actually have been tasked with taking care of all of Pharaoh's livestock. And so they have all of the resources in order to care for this cattle. And so the people give them their livestock, and this benefits them, but it also benefits the children of Israel. It is also interesting to note that when we read of the animals that were sold, we see that is the first mention of horses in the Bible. Many historians agree that the evidence of horses in Egypt was first seen during the Hiskos dynasty, which is mentioned in this previous video regarding the timeline of these events. Now we are coming to the end of the seven years, but the people have run out of anything of value to buy food, except of course their bodies and their land. And so they asked to become slaves or indentured servants to the Pharaoh. In regard to the land, later Egyptian history confirms that Pharaoh was seen to be the owner of all the land, only with the exception of the priests and the military. As far as the people were concerned, it seems their servitude was temporary, but they did have to pay tribute or taxes on the land moving forward, as is recorded here as 20% of their yield. Not horrible in light of the circumstances, and the people praised Joseph for his prudence in these policies. They credited him as saving their lives. And this may serve us as a commentary even for today on what possessions, liberties, and freedoms that a people might give up in times of crisis not thinking about the impact that they'll have on future generations, for power relinquished is almost never returned. I am the Senate. These decisions ultimately just give more power to those who already have it. But let's return to Jacob's family and hear this conversation between him and his son Joseph. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt in the region of Goshen. There they acquired property, were fertile, and increased greatly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years, the span of his life came to a hundred and forty-seven years. When the time approached for Israel to die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If you really wish to please me, put your hand under my thigh as a sign of your constant loyalty to me. Do not let me be buried in Egypt. When I lie down with my ancestors, have me taken out of Egypt and buried in their burial place. I will do as you say, he replied. But his father demanded, Swear it to me. So Joseph swore to him. Then Israel bowed at the head of the bed. The fulfillment of the promise that we've been hearing throughout Genesis is once again reiterated as we are told that they have acquired land, have been fertile, and have multiplied greatly. And then we hear about Jacob's age, and we should be conditioned at this point to realize that this indicates that soon we'll be hearing about his final blessings and his death. But that will have to wait to the next episode, because that will be dragged on for the next couple of chapters, because Jacob has 12 sons to bless, including a couple of grandsons. But in the verses that we just read, we have a promise with a ritual that should also be familiar to us, as we saw this gesture when Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac. In a similar way, this involves a promise regarding the land of Canaan, his wish to be buried with his ancestors and not in Egypt. It's interesting that he makes Joseph make this promise instead of one of his older sons. Well, not too hard to figure out, since Joseph is his favorite and the one who could be counted on to get things done. The first time Joseph agrees, he must not have had his hand placed under the thigh, or Jacob saw that he was not sincere. So he asserts his role as the father and demands that his son make the oath. But after Joseph swears, Jacob bows, which may be a callback to Joseph's dream in which his parents also bow to him. What theological meaning can we find in these narratives today? Well, one of them comes from what Jacob himself says. When he's talking to Pharaoh, he says that he has been sojourning a long time. He refers to himself as a wayfarer. And this can mean, of course, of his journeys with the Lord and his family, but also showing that he is constantly in motion as God calls him and he moves, and also that they will not remain in Egypt. And this is one of the reasons that Jacob insists that he be buried in Canaan. He sees his life and the life of his people to be that of a journey. God has called them to follow him and be ready at a moment's notice to move. If they must stay for a time, that is God's will. If they must travel, that is also God's will. Life is a journey. 
full of unexpected turns. He also believes that the Lord has a destination for them. During this time, it is the promised land, which is understood to be in the presence of God. Christians also consider their destination and final goal to be in the presence of God. Another theme here is that God provides. And throughout this story, we have seen that he does it through Joseph, who acts as a prophet or an ambassador for God. But he doesn't just care for the people of Israel. His care also extends to the people of Egypt, whom he also tends to take care of. And this may be overlooked often throughout the Old Testament because we have so many stories of the conflict between the people of Israel and other nations. And yet here and in a few other stories, it shows that God's care extends beyond the chosen people. And one of the messages that we might get from this is that if God cares for those who do not even know him, how much more will he care for those who do follow him? So what other messages might there be for contemporary readers? While many today do not see every instance of misfortune or fortune as being attributed to God, divine providence is still acknowledged. The world is a tough and often confusing place, especially during this information age in which change seems to be the only constant. But those who do turn to some kind of faith or belief that there is something bigger than themselves, something greater to believe and even commit their lives to, often will find more fulfillment in their lives and realize that they are not alone. There's a scene in The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, which got me teary-eyed the first time that I saw it, and I don't remember the speech being in the book. But there's a scene in which Sam is talking to Frodo, and he's telling him about remembering the stories of old, in which the heroes wanted to give up, but they didn't. And in this scene, Sam is explaining that now he understands why. They kept going because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? There's some good in this world, Mr. Furl, and it's worth fighting for. For Jacob and for Joseph, they knew who they were fighting for, and they knew that there was good in the world. And who they were fighting for was their family, and the good was the God who was leading them. And I think this speaks to the story of journey as well. While I began to look at the stories of Abraham, I made connections to the archetypes and stages found in the hero's journey which I've referred to a number of times as we've been sojourning with the ancestors. It's one that is seen in so many mythologies and classic stories, even in the modern ones that many of us grew up with. They might also be referred to as coming of age stories. No doubt each of you is somewhere on this journey. It could be at the beginning, which is an exciting place to be. Then there are lots of places in the middle, which tend to be the scariest bits. That's usually where the battles are. And some of you may be starting your journey home which is where we see Jacob at this point. The good thing about these journeys is that the hero is never really alone. So something to reflect on might be, who is on the road with me? And I wanna thank you for being with me on this journey. And I hope that you continue as we only have a few more episodes left before we conclude the book of Genesis. So next time we will see when Jacob blesses his sons. Until then, continue your journey and do good.